At first, I was teaching at a traditional school, and I was at Missouri, which did, did become a magnet school, but before it was a traditional school. Uh, we taught the basic curriculum. Life was good. I had a class of maybe 24 boys and three girls, which was a teacher's delight for me. Um, our curriculum was what we, we, we thought it was rigorous. And our children were, um, ability levels were all over the place. So grouping was always important. And in, in most classes, I had three groups and uh, was able to manage them. At that time, we used um, Houghton Mifflin reading program, which I thought was, was good. And our children seemed to thrive. It was still a community based schools, so the children lived in the community. We attended community outings. We got to know the people in the community, and of course I knew my parents because at that time I still would visit or call them on the phone because that's how you gained and developed a relationship. So that's what I was doing. Then I was able to teach at Knott's Environmental Study school. And I left Missouri and went to Knott's in 1989, maybe. And I taught fifth grade. And we were in the process the, of getting the magnet schools up and running. So there were a lot of in services, there was a lot of reading, there was a lot of studying because we were going to be changing our curriculum a little bit and steadily I think it was just the beginning of going to the map in the, in the new district curriculum. Uh, at Knott's it was like I said an environmental study school so we t our emphasis was teaching children to become good stewards of the earth and through being good stewards of the earth they learned all the flora about flora and fauna. We developed a curriculum that allowed us to teach integrated curriculum uh, and then our culminating activity would be a trip to measure, see the woods, see the forest, see deciduous trees in another area, let's say Colorado, and we would take the children on what was called a long distance school. And we were the elementary school. There was a mentor school, and I believe it was Nallen. If it wasn't, I just am sorry. And then the high school was East. And so they did a lot of, uh, they had farm animals, exotic animals. So children were totally immersed in animal care uh, with a curriculum that taught the reading, write, writing, um, science. We were fortunate enough to have teachers and people who were learned and would come and work with us to help the children to make that transition from what they read in books to actual uh, taking care of animals. We grew fruit, we grew winter wheat, we had raised bed gardens at Knott's. Uh, we had encroached on some of the environment uh, at 73rd and Jackson. So we had a few red fox, a few animals that we grew fruit to feed them in the winter. So that's what I, that's how I started my career. There were two, if memory serves me correct. Uh, the first one was busing uh, north to south. And if the directions are wrong, charge it to my head, not my heart. Um, it appeared that four, five, and six, and when I started teaching, seventh grade was in elementary school, but I believe when we started busing, four, five, and six was in elementary school. They would go to a predominantly white area. Uh, we interchanged and inter teachers collaborated with lesson plans. We collaborated with meetings to get culturally correct. And the kindergarten stayed in, the, in their uh, community. We did, the kindergartners were not affected. One, two, and three went one way, four, five, and six went another direction. Then the magnet plan kind of, that kind of catapulted that and that we were looking to attract people back to public school with 
the magnet themes and courses that we thought that would be uh, alluring and they would want to come and be participants in the programs provided by the school district. First, com the first one where we bus the children uh, back and forth, the first plan, I call it my busing plan, our busing plan. The parents were concerned about the number of hours the children spend in transportation, and it was a concern, and it was a legitimate one. Um, we worked it out. There was before cell phones, before everyone had computers, so there was a lot of meetings at both locations so parents could feel comfortable with the children that were coming into the inner city, inner city children that were going to suburban areas. And it worked because we stayed in communication with each other via a telephone, um, but mostly communicate, a fierce communication uh, depending on the, the, the school. And so it was all inclusive to a point. And of course, there are going to be hiccups in anything that you do. Um, I don't remember anything that was traumatic. I just knew that it was a lot of busing, being sure everybody got on the right bus. There was some concerns about support, like with homework. There was some sub concerns about PTA meetings where parents had to travel a great distance, but they managed. Um, and of course, there was some concerns about safety issues. I believe the traditional schools were not treated equitably. Uh, mag all the money was poured into magnet and the magnet theme. And the traditional schools, some got, they got a portion of the money, but not the lion's share like the magnet schools did. And so there, oh, that's going to be some, that's going to cause some concern. And it's not that education suffered, because good teaching was going on in both arenas, but there was still that that sense of magnet schools were pushed and traditional schools were not. And there was more money for teachers. However, overall, I believe all teachers did see some increase in salary, some. I don't remember how much. And when you were at the top of the salary scale at that point, you did not see much. But let's say new teachers coming in. To attract new teachers, the salary was great. And at one point, Kansas City paid well. And there were great in-services to, to to support teaching and to support uh, classroom instruction. Um, so the attitude was, if you were at a magnet school, you had died and gone to heaven. If you were at a traditional school, you worked a little harder and you probably supplied some of your own supplies. As, as, as any teacher would know, some of your supplies came out of pocket. So. That was the difference. I don't think it was an intentional thing. I think it was the push to get the population coming back to, to public school. You know, the students seemed to go with the flow as far as I could concern. Uh, I mean, as far as I was concerned. I think they tended to go with the flow. Some were afraid. Of course, when you go any place new and you're in a new environment, there's a little bit of angst. And we comforted those children that may have had a more severe case. To give you an example, in the magnet schools, we had teachers from Germany, Brussels, Germany, Brussels, the Cameroon, and Spain, I believe. Um, I had the children from Germany. They were very concerned that their children did not learn American slang. And these children spoke about five words when they came into my classroom. By Thanksgiving, what it took one hour to do, and our American students, it took them three hours. By Valentine's Day, they were setting the curve their quest and thirst for knowledge, which I kept in touch with many of them uh, for a long time until they got grown and got, but they stayed in touch with me. And when I was in Paris, mm, 2001 or 2002, I, I communicated with some of the German teachers 
um, because I was as close as I was going to get to them, and they were really trying to get to Paris to visit with me. But you know, I was on a, we were on a tight schedule. But I did stay in touch with most of my parents, even when they left Kansas City and they went back to their countries. And they worked feverishly with our children. They were so so serious about their work and my students were so serious and they would stay after school and I would work with them and I would I, I was not able to be a good English teacher to a German speaking child but I did collaborate with some of my friends at the German magnet to help me with them so I just provided them more time the flexibility of the Iowa test, the basic skills, allowed me to be able to read portions to them and they marked their answers. By the time the map came in, um, was in place, they were tested on grade level and it was a little bit different for them, but most of them stayed uh, five to seven years. That's interesting that I was receptive, that I was open-minded, that I did my very best to um, accommodate children at all ability levels. Um, when they came into the classroom and some of them had never been, had a black teacher or African-American teacher, they had never had one and there might have been some concern about my ability. But after a while, all was well and they, they thrived in my classroom. I think we were under the pressure, we were under a lot of pressure to have everything in place to make sure, sure that children were making progress. Everything, they needed data. And I think the pressure of needing data and the pressure of being in a fishbowl, people watching me teach, people coming into my classroom and taking a seat and they were not intrusive but it was intimidating and you would have people in and out of your classroom when the magnet theme first came from all over the United States observing and watching and taking notes and so that was a bit in, and you got used to it after a while I did get used to it but it disrupted sometimes my instruction and sometimes I felt like I don't need this at this point when I'm teaching because I've had their attention and I don't want it to, I don't want it to lose that because they would be paying attention to who stepped in. But overall, teachers worked extremely hard, long hours, many in services and professional developments, lots of reading, lots of collaboration with other teachers who at that time were involved in magnet programs. A lot of communication with parents, being sure we kept them up to speed, being sure they understood what was going on um, in the community, spreading the word, being sure that people understood that this was good, this was a good, this was a good plan and it would help and it would work for children. Uh, the busing did create a problem because buses were not always picking children up on time and dropping them off. But other than that, I did not see that people were dissatisfied with the the level of instruction with the uh, edifices that were built were beautiful, with uh, academics that were going on and that their children were doing well and thriving. Let's use knots. Since, since that was an environmental studies school, our academic outcome, we had a science teacher. We had, matter of fact, we had a science teacher for pre-K. We had one for intermediate and one for uh, four or five. It was extremely uh, laborious work for children, but they got used to it. Uh, at first, they, they were a little bit concerned. And at first, they felt like we worked them too hard. Um, but then their parents were concerned about the level of work also because not only did they have to learn those things about environmental studies, they just had to learn the basic curriculum for, for the, that grade level. So there was a, an intense amount of what I call preparation time. We needed that time because we, we, we were coming at school at six in magnet schools and we were leaving at seven and eight. And that was a mandatory. That's just what good teachers did. You had to get your work done 
you had to teach all day, and then you had to get your work done. And if it took you to six or seven o'clock, it took you to six or seven o'clock. And we did that for years, and we were happy. Children learn to be tolerant of other cultures, and that was just very, very important. They learn to, to be less critical of others. They learned acceptance. They learned grace. And some said my children had my values. That's unfortunate, but they were good values. They were the good old-fashioned ones. And so I had, you had to walk a thin line on that. However, I had some Native American children, and they had di a different behavior. And my students felt like I gave them more opportunities to, to, to redirect themselves. But I had to because in their culture, anytime the teacher spoke to them, if it, wasn't in a, if it wasn't a praise, then it was negative. And they would hold their heads down and they would be very sad. So keeping a balance in my classroom with the different cultures was dicey sometimes, but we would have what we call class meetings. I started out class meetings. I'm also a SPED teacher, and I worked with emotionally disturbed children, and I disbelieved in inclusion at, at that level. And so I had my 27 plus eight or nine SPED children in my room for uh, always reading and math, and sometimes science. They would go over my class with the science teacher. and. Um, I just thought it was great, and, and they would say, well, um, we, don't, we just want only our class. I said, no, we have to be inclusive, and our, our visitors have to come, and my sped children, I made a special preparation for them. I always wrote action plans for my children by the October. I had to get to know them. I had to develop a relationship with them. I had to call their parents and let them know what my goals were for them. And then I would write little mini, what I called action plans for my children. And then I helped the, the SPED teacher with her IEPs also. I was able to do that. So culturally, these children got, they, they received a lot. They learned a lot. And those children that I taught are now in their 30s, some of them, 30s, and maybe a few 40-year-olds. And they still, when we see each other in passing, they have fond memories of their time spent in elementary school. That to me was one of the challenging questions because what I looked at was, we collaborated with the business industry. What are you looking for in a good employee? Blah, blah, blah. And so starting in elementary, let's using the magnet theme, let's say that the children went to a, um, there was one where they learned about the law, and I think it was East High School, and, and I might be wrong, it might, it might have been Northeast. No, East was one, Northeast. And they learned a lot about government and civics, what we could, would have called back in my day, civics. And so it started a little bit in elementary school, and then it, they had the junior high and the high school. Well, those children, would do apprenticeships with businesses and law firms. They would learn a little bit about clerking. They would learn what, what a day in court looked like. They would go to City Hall and they would sit in on the meetings. So what we were trying to do was start from the inception, which are small children, and then keep them directed into coursework that would transfer into high school, that would transfer into getting a job in the city or other cities in the future. Future work, employees. Oh my goodness, I've lived long enough to know what I don't know. But what I do know is this, smaller size classrooms work. With urban youth, that is a total study by itself. And I have discussed this with my collegiate friends about what are you doing to prepare teachers for the urban child? because that is a different child and because I'm totally been immersed in it all my teaching career, I feel I know something about it. And I know that small classrooms work. I know that wraparound services need to be provided. I know that children come to school and they have had experiences that are unimaginable and we want them to sit in a chair all day and listen to us talk and learn. That is so unfortunate that we're still operating like that. We need counselors. We need huge counseling for children, some children, 
most of them are coming to school and school is the only safe place. So yes, we get to see some of their bad acts because they know we're, we're not going to harm them. However, we need to think about how we can address those children. We used to call them at risk, but they're not. It's a whole community and it's a whole family of them. I mean, I worked with, a, I haven't cried in years but I was just heartbroken. I had a family this past school year. I'm an intervention teacher at the Truist Elementary and they were homeless. And believe it or not, the district tries to do its best, but it is a societal problem as well. And we're having more and more of these types of situations that impact the learning of small children. I have children that have been to school in three years and they're in the fourth grade. I'm concerned. And I know how to develop and tailor a plan to support that child. But realistically, you're not going to be able to catch them up. What you'll need to do is teach them how to survive and thrive in society with basic, what I call real life skills. And somewhere I read, and I don't know when, but I was always, uh, we were always like studying brain-based information and I want to be sure I quote myself right, that when I'm working with children, that is the science piece is so important to me. And so I want to know what stops a fellow from learning. I uh, went to school, I worked at Ozanam at one point in my life and we did BISC and there was a triage piece to the BISC that I truly enjoyed because I had some people that I had to get ready to get ready for school. And one of the things I learned is that research tells us that by age 10, you lose 50% of your ability to acquire language. So if that happens, if a student isn't reading on grade level by fifth grade, I mean by first grade, it's very, they have to work twice as long and twice as hard to get work done. And we are inundated with children who are not reading on grade level. So our job is to sit down, our job as teachers, we need to sit down and take a look at our population and see exactly where they are academically. And I know tests just give us a piece of the pie, but you can do what I call just conversations with children. Some children are very intellectually smart with conversation, but they cannot decipher and read and write the, the text. So we need to develop and not be held to these unrealistic time spans about where to get so-and-so from point A to point B. And that is my concern. And my concern is early intervention. You cannot talk about children are not on grade level at fifth grade and expect them to be anywhere near that if their deficit is three or more years. But what we can do is work to get them up a year work hard and we cannot expect these children to have our values and go home and their parents are going to sit down with them and help them because they're not. So we are the first thing and we're the last hope and we have to get something done during the day and I know that sounds a bit optimistic but it can be done. It just can't be done on the unrealistic time frames of some school districts. And it, we can't just mark them off the list because they're slow or they takes them more opportunities. I'm an LD teacher. I know it takes sometimes 15 times for a child, sometimes 27 times for a child to hear something and understand it and know it. Some may even take as many as 100. Well, no, we can't spend the whole day with that one child, and I understand that. But what we can do is give them opportunities to practice. And, have, and, and by that, I mean if they're in smaller classes with teachers who truly are able to work with children who have learning issues, then I think we can make some progress. But we can't warehouse these children and say, I want you on page 53 by September the 12th, and I want you on page 89. It's just not going to work. So that's my spill on that. We never would get a handle on school integration realistically because people moved. And they moved because they could. And 
I mean, who am I to say that you should have stayed someplace so your child could see a child of another culture? We can control integration through school, but we cannot control integration through where people live. And people will continue to move and flee when they become concerned and or unhappy about what is happening in their environment, especially when they feel they have no control. And that's my spill. We work with the children and not with the parents. That's just how it's been, that's how it's happened. That's how I see it. <laughs>